you an early mark I'm, I'm keen not to uh, I'm keen not to deliver on that in a miserly way I'm, I'd like you to have a decent early <laughs> so who's looked at task two over the break yes is it the most awesome assignment ever no. yes <laughs> that's fantastic I love it completely um, so we, what we're going to do is, if you haven't looked at it over the break, don't worry, because we're about to look at it now together, and we'll go over and talk about it together. But I'm just going to finish talking about hash tables first, then we're going to talk about the assignment, so you've got something to do over the weekend. Do we... Um, oh, I have another one here. Uh, let me just put the lights off. No kitten that loves fish is unteachable. No kitten without a tail will play with a gorilla. Kittens with whiskers always love fish. No teachable kitten has green eyes. No kittens have tails unless they have whiskers. Oh, by the way, the solution to the last one. Everyone that knows, put up your hand. Yes, lots of you. Fantastic. We'll just pick one at random. You. Yes. Oh, sorry, you got a mouthful. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> I was trying to make you choke. Heimlich. Does anyone know Heimlich? Oh, the other one. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can look at it. Yeah, sure, 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 sure. sure. Do you remember it? I despise anything that cannot be used as a bridge. Anything that is worth writing an ode to would be a welcome gift to me. A rain oh, it's falling down. A rainbow will not bear the weight of a wheelbarrow. Whatever can be used as a bridge will bear the weight of a wheelbarrow. I would not take as a gift the thing that I despise. Yes, and a rainbow is not worth writing an I would not write an ode to a rainbow. A rainbow is not worth writing an ode to. That's right. A rainbow is not worth writing an ode to. Which is insane. I mean, hence we see logic once again. Insane. Does everyone get that? Does everyone can follow the steps? Make sure you can do this. Is there anyone that can't? You, you, you can't do it? Should we do it together? Yes. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, a rainbow will not bear the weight of a wheelbarrow. Whatever can be used as a bridge will bear the weight of a wheelbarrow. Hence, a rainbow cannot be used as a bridge. Do you agree with that? Okay. Uh, top line, I despise anything that cannot be used as a bridge. We know a rainbow cannot be used as a bridge, hence I despise a rainbow. That's, that's a good name for a song, isn't it? I would not take as a gift a thing that I despise. I would not take as a gift a rainbow. I would not take a rainbow as a gift. Everything that is worth writing an ode to would be a welcome gift to me. A rainbow would not be a welcome gift to me. Hence, this part cannot be true if this part is false, because this sentence is saying, if this is true, this is true. I know this is false. That tells me this must be false. So a rainbow is not worth writing an ode to. And that is Lewis Carroll. He's a, just a wonderful, playful man who hates rainbows. What's that? A song about hash tables. A song about hash tables. Oh, uh, we could write a song about hash tables. We, we could. We could write all sorts of songs. I like, you know, I really love this geeky, um, we're completely wasting time in our short lecture, but um, I really love these geeky, nerdy songs of people just rejoicing in having fun. So please, anyone that wants to create your own video that we can put up and laugh at, uh, <laughs> that would be awesomely good and I would be very proud of you. And I did feel bad uh, yesterday. Some people did put up a video and it went for a long time and I was a bit worried it had gone too long and might have been off the point. But nonetheless, I realised afterwards I should have rejoiced a bit more that they'd made a video, because it was quite an awesome video, wasn't it? And they did put a phone inside a balloon, which I've been trying to do ever since and not <laughs> able to do. So I uh, don't know how they did that. OK. Uh, so the remaining problem. We've seen <clears throat> the problem of hash tables <laughs> is in two parts. One is we need to, well, I sort of set it up here. To avoid rummaging round, we can go right to the right spot and get what we need if, A, we have a magic oracle, and B, um, the stuff is stored in a structure which permits random access. And we've spent our whole conversation up until now talking about, essentially, a structure that permits random access. And that structure has um, probing or 
has overflow chain lists or something like that. That's the structure. But in terms of magically knowing where to go, we haven't done anything more magical or sophisticated than saying, oh, it, every chair is numbered with your birth date. Now, that works out fine if the data you've got is, has a birth date on it, which is in the range 0 to 365, or 364, 365, I guess, and the table we want to make is about 360 big, then lo and behold, the planets line up and everything's fine. But what if you wanted to be able to hash all you people, hash means put you magically into the right spot, and I only had 100 seats? Or what if I had 1,000 seats? Well, then birth date suddenly isn't a really good way of working it out. So what we need to be able to do is, oh, I've got 1,000 seats, and I want to work out where to put students so I can find them straight away. I know knowing the name of the student or knowing the number of the student, I can know straight away which seat to look at. Let's say it's student number. If I knew your student number, I could straight away work out which seat to look in. I've got 1,000 seats. I need to somehow convert that big number to a number between 0 and 999. Similarly, if I was hashing your name, I'd need to convert that string, which has billions of possible combinations, to a number between 1 and 1,000. Well, 0 and 999. That part is called hashing. And that's our magical oracle. The magical oracle is some function that converts the non-numeric thing into a numeric lookup code that will tell us exactly which cell in the array we need to get to. It's an oracle, but it's no more complex than a function. But we'd better pick a good function. There's no point in having a dumb oracle because you use the same oracle for putting the things away and getting them. Okay? The hash function tells you where to put them when you're storing it, and the same function tells you where to get them when you're getting them back. And of course, it would work fine as long as it's consistent no matter what it said, wouldn't it? If it always said, oh, I just put it in seat number one. You say, where is the thing? Oh, look in seat number one. That would work, but you'd have horrible overflow and clustering problems, but it would work. So, for example, Gwen could just always say, Dad, look in your key bowl, couldn't she? And whenever we find any object in the house, we just put it in the key bowl. <laughs> it need to be a big key bowl, but then everything would be in the key bowl. And, you know, but you can see it's a, not a very good or oracle strategy. You really want the oracle wisely to distribute the data uniformly over the table, but then be able to remember exactly where it's put it and get it back. We want it to have, um, <clears throat> that's called hashing, that, that property. The oracle's going to be a hash function. Converting things that aren't integers into integers in the right range. Or converting things that are integers but in the wrong range to integers in the right range. So let's look at our oracle. Um, <coughs> suppose we have this problem. Uh, we're, we're looking at all the movie reviews of the film called The Matrix. And we're counting the frequency of words in those reviews. Because maybe what we want to do, diabolically, is write a computer program to randomly generate reviews of the matrix. And then we're just going to post them to IMDb. What do you think of that? That would be awesome. All we have to do is find the right frequency of words that are used in these reviews, randomly generate words with the same frequency and stick them in, and it would more or less match the reviews that I see in IMDb for the matrix. <laughs> so, that's our strategy. What we want to do is create somehow a list of the most, 100 most popular words in matrix reviews. Here's how I propose we do it. I, we could get all the reviews of the matrix ever made and put them in all, and uh, concatenate them all together to get a huge long file and then read that into memory and get an enormous list of strings, enormous list of words, sorry, break into words, and then sort that enormous list of words and then go through counting the number that are the same and working out keeping track of the 100 most common or something. We could do that, but that's at least n log n it's sounding like to me, doesn't it? Because there's a lot of sorting and things like that. How about this is a faster way. I, I read all the reviews of the matrix and I have a big hash table. And every time I get a word out of a review, I just whack it in the hash table. And if the word's already in the hash table, I just increase the count for that word. What do you think of that? So I just grab the item, whack it in. 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 Then everything gets the count calculated automatically. All that mucking around I had to do with sorting before to put adjacent things next to each other. Now that the Oracle's doing that for me. I'm saving an n log n. I still have to have an n because I have to put everything in, don't I? I have to touch everything once, but it's order n. And <clears throat> I've still got the same problem at the other end, which is once I've clustered everyone together, I now have to go through counting and working out who's the most frequent. But uh, now that's much easier because the first part's been easier. So that's my strategy. See a word stuck in the hash table. See a word stick in the hash table. See a word stick in the hash table. If it's already in the hash table, increase the count. So it's not a, a, a set anymore. A set would only record if, uh, record if the number, word was there or not. It's actually a dictionary now. Remember the difference between set and dictionary? So I need to, for each word, for each key, record extra data that's not in the key. I need to record its frequency. Someone pointed out during the break, in a hash table, if we're just implementing a set with a hash table, then we don't have to worry about duplicates. As soon as I see the same key appearing twice, I can just throw it away the second time because I only need to store things in a set once. 
The only operation you ever have on a set is add it to the set if it's not in there. If it is in there, don't change the set. And query is, is it in the set or not? You can't ask questions like how many times is it in the set or when was it put in. So for sets, uh, it's much easier. But for a dictionary like this, we're going to have to put everything in. We can't ignore anything. So does that seem like a reasonable strategy? So we need to have a hash function now to hash words. And maybe I'm going to have a table with a million entries. Maybe I think there's going to be a million different words. Um, or maybe it's only, no, actually think of the vocab thing. Maybe it's only like 10,000 words or something like that that I'm expecting to see. So I'll have a hash table. And I'm going to get words coming in. And I'm going to somehow take a word and convert it to a number between 0 and 9,999. And I've got to do that fast in constant time, or this isn't saving me anything. So it's got to be a fast function. And then that spot, gets, the thing gets chucked into now, what properties does my hash function have to have? What, let's give me some random hash functions we could use for a start. Make them bad ones so we can make it better and better. MD5. No, you're giving me a good one. No, 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 no. Didn't, no, not MD5. A bad one. A bad one like, um, say, oh, <laughs> let's look at the two first letters of each word. There's 26 squared combinations. I had a problem with it, too. It does have a problem, but... Not a serious problem, not the sort of problem. I'm looking for glaring, serious problems. M MD5, well, MD5 has, a, we'll talk about MD5 later on. MD5 have, has other problems, which is, it's very complex to work out. So we want this, we're doing this for speed. Calculating MD5 all the time might, might slow us down. Shh, 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 shh. MD5, I just started talking about MD5. What's MD5? Oh, it was a rhetorical question, but tell me. It is, yes, but what is it? Because the Hamburglar is susceptible to birthday attacks, but he's not MD5. It's a hashing algorithm. That's right. It's a hashing algorithm. Well, that's the Hamburglar too. Oh, it's spooky. They're the same. Their external attributes are the same. Uh, here's how it goes. I'm now asking for you to give me a function that's going to behave like an oracle. These functions are tricky to come up with to make them really good. Whenever anyone comes up with a really good one, they publish it, and it gets given a name, and then everyone knows it. And the name tends to be the letters of the people that invented it. So MD5 was invented by someone whose name starts with M, Mr. Machine. Someone whose name starts with D, Bob Digest. And um, that amazing girl from the fifth element. <laughs> OK. OK. So. Uh, so, uh, so, so, but MD5 is a famous hash algorithm, but it's a cryptographic hash, has all these extra properties, and it takes a long time to compute. So we're not going to talk about that function right now. Um, uh, but I'm just, so here's a dumb function. What's that you say? Take the first two letters. Take the first letter, not the first letter. Take the first letter. That'll only hash to 26 places. What's the problem? Too many collisions, not, unif not distributed nicely over the table. In fact, not even distributed nicely over those 26 spots. Because many, many more of the words will start with... Um, T, then we'll start with Z in reviews of the matrix, for example. So, uh, so that's not a very nice function. So this gives us our first property that we're after. We'd really like it to use the whole table. No point if it doesn't use the whole table. And we'd like it to uniformly distribute things over the table. And how we normally express that is we would like the chance of a collision on randomly generated data, <coughs> or the data we're likely to get, if we, if we know enough about its distribution, we would like the chance of it to collision to be hello. How low would you really like the chance of a collision to be? Zero. zero. Can we achieve a zero collision rate? Is collision detection or something? Uh, no, a collision rate in the hash function. Collision detection happens after the hash function. Can we achieve zero collisions? No. Yes. yes, when? If you have one item. What's that? You have one item. You've got one item. Yes. <laughs> one item is not going to collide with any other item. And we can generalize that answer. If you've got a table that has 1,000 entries, and you're going to put a thousand things in it, then it is conceivable, isn't it, that you won't have a collision. The chances are low unless you knew those thousand items in advance. But if you did know those thousands items in advance, and I'm working on a chute question around this at the moment, it's called perfect hashing. If you do know the thousand items in advance, you can come up with a perfect function that puts everyone in the right spot. But in general, if it's random data, you're not going to get that. And as soon as you get to 1,001, it doesn't matter. Um, if you've got 1,001 entries to put in a 1,000 table, the pigeonhole principle tells you, no, you're going to have a collision. So we are going to have collisions. So although our dream is to say we would like our hash function to not have any collisions, what we actually have to say is a bit weaker. We say, 
Is someone, did someone have their hand up? No, no. Uh, we'd like the hash function to have the property that uh, the chance of a collision is as low as it can be. So it's m on n, or 1 on n, or whatever. Uh, I have to work that out. If you've got, I uh, should actually write it up, shouldn't I? If you've got m things in your table, m cells in the table, so for example, this cell table have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And you're going to stick 50 things into it. No, you're going to stick 48 things into it. What would I like the chance of a collision to be? Four. Four? No, the probability has got to, I, I, I tricked you by saying, <laughs> making them divisible. Well, the probability has got to be between 0 and 1. So what's the chance of a collision? Given two items, I better say it more explicitly, X and Y, you're right. Four is the expected number of collisions. We want in every cell. That's exactly right. I didn't say the question very well. I'd like my, if my hash function's H, I'd like H of X to equal H of Y with probability what? What's the probability of this being true? Given two hash, given one hash function, two inputs, what's the chance that the output is going to be the same? No, I can't. I'd like it to be zero, yes, but I can't have it zero. One on n. One on n, that's right. One on m, yeah, one on 12 in this case. You'd like it to distribute them over the thing as randomly as possible so there's no more than one on 12 chance of any two, any pair colliding, which will give us an expected number of collisions for each cell of four. That's what we'd like. That's our dream hash function. But hash functions have to have more properties than that. And maybe that's all stuff we can talk about in the tune, and maybe next week, because I'm now itching to talk about task two. Uh, oh, desired properties? Yeah, I was going to talk about desired properties. Uh, and I did have something to say about matrix reviews. Well, let me just say that very quick, and then I promise I'll talk about task two. What would be a better hash function for words than just taking the first two letters? Because that's hopeless. It's not going to occupy the whole table range. And these pairs called digrams or digraphs or something like that. Uh, no, diagrams. Diagrams uh, in English aren't uniformly distributed either. For example, which pair occurs quite a lot? E-R-T-H, in which pair hardly ever occurs? Q-A, yeah, Z-Y, yeah, yeah, yeah. Z-Y, Sig Ziggy, had a fuzzy, these, see, they know weird things. It's very hard, but yeah, yeah. Q-A would never occur in any legally spelled word, would it? Okay, so, shh, 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 shh. so what's a better function? Come on, guys, quick, you need a function. I can't tell you about task two until you tell me a function. This is like dot in the morning. Dot, we're not going to read a book until you've put on your underpants. Yeah, yeah it, no, it's a rule in our family. So I'm just going to sit here until you guys all put on your underpants and tell me a better hash function. There's no talking about task two. And no dessert. No. <laughs> Stop smirking. <laughs> Off to your room when I'm talking to you. Yes. Oh, very nice, very nice. Okay. We, we could say, uh, I, that's too good. Z, can you think of something that's not quite as good as that, that we can make fun of, and then suggest that as the answer? Uh, it's still too good. Uh, it, but it's not as good, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, add the next character. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe we could say, we'll add up the ASCII codes of the characters. Does that make sense? In the word. That's going to give us a better distribution than just looking at the first three. What's the problem with that? Well, there's several, but the one I want. Tell me them all, though. Problem? Yeah. Okay, you add the numbers up and mod them by the size of the table. So all our operations now, all our calculations are going to be mod M. I, I will forget to say that. What's that? We get a hell of a lot of collisions. Yes, we'll get a lot of collisions, but tell me the problem with that function specifically, adding up the characters. Diagrams aren't really a problem anymore. Because other letters mucked them up. What is it? When you permute the letters, you get the same hash. Does that make sense? This is, so what I'm trying to, what I'm hoping to show you is that um, 
what we want is any order in the input. We don't want to be preserved in the output. Because if our hash function is order preserving in any way at all, then the adversary is going to give us data which doesn't have perfect entropy and we're going to be stuffed. So we do not want to have it that permuting the letters keeps the hash value the same because is there anything in the matrix which is just a permutation of something else? Probably not. So that's probably a safe one. Probably a safe one. But other than that, it's not a very good hash function. So a better one, Z's function, is what? It's zoo. Nooths. What, you stole it? You have to footnote when you call out someone else's thing in class. Oh, it's licensed, yeah. It's, okay, but you never know who actually came up with it first. What's that? No, well done. No, it's a good one. Say it again. Times 33 XOR by the next one. This is very nice. Let's have a look at why it's good. I, I've got to say, people do make fun of Newt's functions now. They're not as... Um, <clears throat> they were, he loves prime numbers and modding. <laughs> Turns out there are entropy-preserving properties when you uh, mod by a number and, um, and use primes, but uh, they're high-dimensional weird properties that aren't going to affect us right now. But they're not perfect, but they're damn still worth uh, well talking about, and as a first hash function, it's worth doing. So you suggested we times it by 33 <coughs> plus the next. What did he actually mean? Well, if I've got the string, say, um, uh, cat, well, that's unlikely to be in a matrix review. What, what's a word that's likely to be in a matrix review? Neo. Glad you picked a short one that I could spell. Thank you. So what we do is we say n is the, I'm guessing, 14. <laughs> e is the fifth, and O is the 15th number in the alphabet. So you go, it's 14 times 33 plus uh, 5 times 33 plus 15, uh, whoop, what have I done there? Probably need lots more brackets, times 33. Does that make sense? You keep folding them in. And because you keep folding them in, the innermost one, which I've done it in a backwards way, I think the innermost one being 14 here, gets multiplied by 33 three times. And the outermost one only got multiplied by 13 once, 33 once. And probably, actually, I could have dropped one of those 30 multiplies off. So because I get multiplied by a different, um, <coughs> because I get multiplied by uh, um, uh, uh, the constant a different number of times, permuting them, you can see, will change the expression. Because one of them is multiplied by 33 twice, one of them is multiplied by 33 once. If you swap them around, now the different ones are being multiplied by different things, so it's not the same. But if you just add them together, you know yourself. You've got an expression, you add a whole lot of things together. You swap those things around, you still get the same answer. But if you've got some more complex expression, you swap things around, they don't. So this is very nice. This is um, a sort of folding function. This is very simple and quick to calculate. Uh, uh, someone, yes? Uh, y33 as opposed to another number? Oh, Y33, well, um, 33 is very close to 32. So on early um, chips, it can actually be quite fast to multiply by 33. You multiply it by 32. Multiplying something by 32, uh, well, 32 is 2 to the 5. So in base 2, multiplying by 32 is the same as in decimal multiplying by 10,000. Now, if I was going to give you a hard five-digit multiplication, you'd really want me to say, multiply this number by 10,000, because you can do it in one second, can't you? You just add zeros on. So on the computer, they can do this multiply by 32 with just a bit shift. They just bit shift at five along, and times 33 it means you then add the original one back in. So it's uh, a bit shift and an add gives you a multiply by 33. That tends to be quite fast. In the old days, multiplications were slow and hard to do. Uh, and then an addition is fast too. So it's, it's got two additions and a bit shift. So it's, it's on most chips, that's quite a fast way of doing things. Um, okay, so I think that's all I wanted to say about hashing. Shh, shh, shh. For now, oh, we'll keep talking about it. Hashing's a beautiful thing because it's so closely tied to randomness. You can see I love randomness. Hashing's all about preserving, is destroying order in things and introducing randomness. Uh, and yeah, and it's very hard to know when you've got a good hash function. Uh, you can find problems with them, but just because you haven't found a problem with one doesn't mean there isn't. Uh, yes, Richard. 
Oh, why, why not 32? Oh, well, if we multiply by 32, uh, what we're going to have to do is, at the end of this operation here, we're going to have to mod by the size of the um, hash table. So you do this operation and you mod by the size of the hash table. Now, modding is a very expensive operation on a computer because it's a division. You know, mod means divide this by that and tell me what the remainder is. So you've got to do a division. And you probably remember from primary school, of all the four operations, the one that wasted most of your life was division. You know, you have to do all these cal same on a computer. So we don't like divisions. They're really slow. So modding is really slow. It's a pain in the bum. Except, what's one division you really, what's one modding you really like? If I said, what's the remainder of 512 divided by 32, uh, div no, sorry, 512 divided by 69, what's the remainder? You'd go, bah! Well, you'd probably work it out. But if I said to you, what's the remainder of 502 mod, mod 10, divided by 10? It's the last digit. So, so modding by 32 is a really fast operation. So you'd normally set your hash table. This is just, we're now looking at the esoteria of why Nuth picked a particular function. You'd pick it to fit your needs, but Nuth's sort of here thinking, you're probably going to pick a hash table that's a power of two in size, because then the mod will be really fast. Now, you don't want your mod to be the same as your multiply, because then you're multiplying by 10 and taking the remainder. You're just going to be getting the next. Sort of thing. Okay, so you want you essentially want these numbers at war with each other. Because you really want this to be a power of two, you want this to really have no factors in common with that. It turns out that gives you the best thing. And no factors in common is easiest to work out if you don't know what this will be, just some power of two. Uh, it's easiest to work. If you stick a prime in there, everything seems to work really well. Other things that are co-prime to two would work as well, but primes seem to work really nicely. Yeah, and 32, 33 is a lovely prime sitting right. No, no, it's not a prime. No, it's not a prime. So it's stuck. It's stuffed. It's stuffed. Yeah. <laughs> but it has no factors in common with 32, so that's good. It'd be better if it was a prime. If we knew a prime that was one more or one less than a power of two, that would be a really good thing to include, for example. Yep. And there's a table of them in Noose books, for example. Uh, in any decent book and algorithms, when you're picking values, you often want crazy primes near powers. Values near powers are easy to get hold of. Isn't like a mod of two or something just um, ending by like the end bits? Yeah, yeah. A mod, a, mod, a mod of a power of two is just giving you the trailing bits. Yes, yes, exactly right. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly right. Oh, how come mod 10? Shh, shh, shh. That was a good question. How come it's easy to do mod two, <coughs> but it's hard to do mod 10 on a computer? It's nothing. <coughs> it's nothing fundamental that makes it easy or hard. It's just that computers. Everything is done. The circuitry is all in base two. Okay. Ands and ors and everything's using two-valued logic. So we talked about this before. Two-valued logic tends to be what's used inside a computer. If you're using two-valued logic, then operations to the power of two or to base two are all really fast because they just involve moving the data around changes its value, multiplies by two, divides by two. But doing operations, just in base 10, it's easy to move, multiply and divide by 10. Yeah. There's no reason. We talked a bit about it briefly, or I think I posed a challenge to you. Why base 2? Why don't computers use some other base? <coughs> and I think I've cleverly avoided answering that question up till now, and I hope there are some people still beavering away trying to work out what the answer to that is. Now, we, we are using up this time, and I promised an early mark. Oh, my God. All right, quick. But without any further ado, let's talk about the project. The project shh, 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 is coming out right after the holidays. Next week's our last week before the holiday. Now, when the project comes out, it's like, <clears throat> you know, have you ever been on that ride that um, used to be at Luna Park, that isn't anymore, that used to just go up and up and up and up and up and up into the sky, and then would sit there very pleasantly and sort of misleadingly, and then say, boom. <laughs> okay. This is the break. Okay. So after the break, suddenly, boom, 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 boom. We're going to be using everything we've learned. We're going to be building stuff. We're going to be doing the project. And the project is the heart of the course. Because to do the project, you need to do everything we've done in the course. And to do it well, you get to apply all the different ideas and invent your own algorithms. Do crazy. It's like the test bed for the course. So in a sense, I don't really care how you go in the exam. I don't care about anything else you do. If you do a good project, or no, I don't even care if you do a good project. If you try hard on the project and do a better project than you think you could have done, then uh, that means to me that you've exceeded your own expectations in this course. The project is it. As far as I'm concerned, whoa, project's everything. So it's coming out after the break. So we're now in this It's going to be fun. It's not going to be too hard. But what will make it hard and not fun is if you adopt my strategy for things in life, which is not think about them till just before the due date and then suddenly get very, very stressed. 
that's not going to work. You really need advice from all previous, all previous courses. I was going to say all students in all previous courses. But advice from all previous courses from the students, because I always ask at the end, what's your advice to give to the students next year? I haven't taught this course for many years, so I don't have any advice to offer you. But I can tell you what the advice that I got from 1917 two years ago, which was do your labs, I think. Actually, was that the advice? Do your labs? Even if you miss them, do them in your own time because at the end of the course you'll suddenly kick yourself if you haven't done the lab questions. That was the advice from the students last year. And the advice from the students the year before that was start the assignment as soon as you get it. Because if you leave it too long, thinking, oh, it's easy, then suddenly it all gets stressful. But if you start it in time, everything's easy. It won't be hard at all. So to help you not make it easy and to start on time and to have fun, next week we'll be telling you some of the details about the assignment. You'll be forming a pair with someone else from your tutor group. Your tutor will form it, not you. And make sure you get with someone who has the same work value as you. Don't be with your friend. Being with your friends is a bad thing because uh, your friend is often hard to yell at <laughs> or, or it's not good to yell at because uh, they're your friend. But also, um, the most important thing is not to be with someone you like or who smells nice. The most important thing is to be with someone <laughs> who cares about the assignment exactly the same amount as you. So if you both don't give a damn, you're a perfect pair. And if you both want to come top in the course, you're a perfect pair. But if you're the best friends in the universe and one of you doesn't give a damn and one of you wants to come top in the course, you will not be the best friends at the end of the course. So please pick someone who, who just is going to put the same degree of passion and energy into it as you and then everything will work out fine. Um, so your tutors in your tutors next week will pick the pairs with you and you all know who your pairs are and they'll tell you the problem. Shh, shh. Now the problem is to work out a strategy to do something and they'll tell you the thing. So you'll have the whole holidays to sit there with your partner talking about the thing. Okay? <laughs> he says cryptically. So it might be write a program to <coughs> play billiards and, 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 and get the balls in a certain configuration. Shh, 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 shh. So you, I would hope you would then spend the holiday with your partner playing billiards the whole time and lurking about billiards and learning about billiards. So when we start the project and I say, okay guys, here's, here's your billiard cues, time to go, you don't suddenly go, oh, how do I play the game? What's going on? Whoa, whoa, whoa. You're just off playing straight away. Yeah, this is the stuff we practice in the holiday, man. So that's my suggestion. That's the project. Next week, come out. Have lots of fun, but do start and think about the project during the holidays. But the project won't be starting officially till after the holidays because what you're working on during the holidays is task two, which is coming out negative one hour ago. <laughs> it's out in draft form, and I'll put the final one out probably Friday or Saturday. It's due during the holidays. You may well be able to knock it off long before the holidays start. Here it is. Shall we look at it? Task two. Oh, is it? Bit, let's dim it down, board, off. Here we go. Shh. Draft. Oh, it's got an inspirational Dan Brown quote at the top. Uh. <laughs> you are, you are a computing lecturer at UCGN, and you're thinking of setting an assignment which students, in which the students are to devise the longest running, but eventually terminating, invite program they can using a very simple microprocessor, the 4442, that you have devised. Okay, so you're at a hypothetical university, you're a lecturer, you're about to set the students an assignment in which they're going to write the most... <laughs> longest running assignment. They're going to write the longest running thing they can ever write. Does that make sense? But you're... Actually, I was going to say print the most beeps out. I wish I had said that. So, you're, you're a lecturer, just to pretend those words aren't there. Oh, it's a wiki. If you don't like the assignment at all, the most beeping, okay, okay, so, shh, 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 shh. you're a lecturer, starting again, you're a lecturer at a uni, you're about to set an assignment. The assignment is going to be to get students to write the most beeping thing they can on this fictional microprocessor. But just before you set the assignment, you're a bit nervous. A, that they might be able to copy from a previous year. Because a previous year has used the same microprocessor with the same codes. So you're thinking, I could change all the instructions, but I love those instructions. They make me very happy. And you think, I know, all I've got to do 
is change what instruction corresponds to what number. If I flip a few of the instructions around, that's enough to make it different enough they can't copy for each other. So you decide that the new chip you're going to develop, the 4242, is going to be exactly the same as the 4442, except it's going to permute the instructions around a bit. And you're trying to think, hmm, in this assignment, what's the best way I can permute the instructions around? <laughs> so that's your puzzle number one that you're thinking about. And your puzzle number two is you're a bit worried about marking them because you know you've got some very, very good students in the course and they're going to print out programs which do ridiculous numbers of beeps. And it may take the, the program a year to run before it actually prints out all the beeps and terminates. And you really want to know in advance how big a problem you can ask them to solve before the amount of time it takes it just becomes ridiculous. So you decide to yourself write a very simple, small program. This is what you're going to do. You're going to write a tiny little program, you the lecturer, which given a 4242, which is just a permuted 4442, given a 4242, and given the number n, like 3, works out the longest amount of time a 3-byte program can run before it stops. It's got to be a terminating program. Does that make sense? And then as long as you can make that number reasonable, you can release the real assignment that you want to release. Does that make sense? So that's the background story. Now, what you guys have to do is you have to pretend you're a lecturer. Now, in this assignment, this is what I like the most about it, I get to write you complaining emails. <laughs> Every day, I'm just going to write you mails complaining about the assignment that you're setting. <laughs> it's so good. And bugs in it. And when you submit it, I'm going to say, all the mistakes are in it. Oh, it's good. It's the best assignment I've ever set. Okay. So don't get, uh, well, part of the assignment is understanding the assignment. But I'll, I'll explain the assignment and then I'm hoping there'll be like a few questions and it'll all become clear. So what you've got to do is this. That was the background story. You've got to do, write us program in C, which takes two arguments from the command line. The first is a 16 character string consisting of a permutation of the digit 0 to 9 and letters A to F. And that permutation tells us how you're jumbling the instructions up. Okay, so if you just said, here we are, uh, the program's called how many. So if you ran how many, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, A, B, C, D, E, F, that's saying don't permute them at all. Call instruction 0 in the new chip, it's going to be called 0. Instruction 1 in the new chip is going to be called 1. Instruction 2 in the new chip is going to be called 2. So you haven't changed any of the instructions at all. Does that make sense? But second example, if you ran it like this, how many, 0, 2, 1, that would be saying the new chip that I'm going to build, that I haven't yet built, is going to be exactly the same as the old one, but instructions 1 and 2 are swapped around. Does that make sense? So if you want to subtract, what was the old code for subtract? 2. So what are you going to have to issue now to subtract? 1. Okay. So it's just this tiny little permutation you put at the beginning that's going to jumble the chip up a little bit. And then you think I can use this assignment every year from now on just by changing the permutation. That's really cool. And it also takes in a number that's how big a program you are going to ask the students to write. So you might think, I'm going to ask the students on this permuted chip to write the longest four-byte four program they can, do the most beeps they can. And your program here has to print out how long their program could run before it terminates. If it's an infinite program, we don't count it. But if it's a terminating program, what's the maximum amount of time it could take? So that's your challenge, to write a program that, given another program, works out how long it'll run for before it terminates. Does that make sense? Questions? Ask me a question. It's just a sea of happy faces. Yes, you're up the back. Do you care about instructions or beeps? Do I care about instructions or beeps? No, I only care about instructions. I wrote beeps at the top. That's the assignment you're about to set. You guys are about to set an assignment. You need to write this program first before you set the assignment. There's no point setting an assignment if the longest running program is going to go forever. So you would like to write an assignment that, that generates beeps for me to do. Right? You're writing an assignment for me. You, it's sort of backwards, okay? You're writing an assignment for me. That's the backstory here. And you want me to write a program that has lots of beeps, but you're nervous that my program, the beepy program, is going to run so long that it's, you're not going to be able to mark it because it's going to run like for a year. So before you ask me to do this, you're just double checking what's the longest program I could possibly write. So we don't actually care about beeps. We don't actually care about beeps at all, which is why I could change the top and it didn't change the assignment at all. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but I did set the beep thing just to get you sort of warmed up thinking about beeps. Yes. Um, what's the maximum number that you can give us for like the n byte program? Well, say for example, if I said, suppose I said 16, which how would I describe 16 by the way? A, uh, F. <laughs> F. 
Uh, no, 16, I can't say 16. Oh, no, well, uh, I could say 1-0. Oh. No, let's forget that. I'm not going to say 15. Suppose I, 16. Suppose I said a 15-byte program. I would say F. So I'd say, what's the longest amount of time a 15-byte program could run for before it stopped? Your program would then have to compute how long it could run before it stops. The obvious way of computing this is trying every single 15-byte program, emulating it, and seeing how long it goes before it stops. How many 15-byte programs are there? A very big number. So I could never ask you this with f equals 15 and expect you to be able to stop. So how big can I ask you? Well, that's your race. You've got to make your thing return an answer as quickly as it can. And I'm going to compete to see who does the most. So some of you will be able to compute all 4-byte programs. Some of you will be able to evaluate all 5-byte programs. <laughs> Some of you might be able to evaluate all six byte programs. Maybe three people could do all seven byte programs. Maybe one person can do all eight byte programs. And no one's going to be able to do all nine byte programs. It's going to turn out something like that. Does that make sense? Yep. What is the time limit? The time limit has got to be, well, we're just going to race them. So it's going to be a uniform benchmark when we're marking. We just want you to be as fast as you can. But what I'm thinking the benchmark will probably be, we just say reasonable amount of time, is probably an hour on a lab-like machine. So what's the most you can do in an hour on a lab-like machine? Is what I'm thinking. But when we get to the final few, when we're down to the last five people, we might run each of them for a week you know, to break the tie. You know, they're all doing eight, and we want to see who's going to finish the eight first. Yeah, yeah. Is it going to be plus graded marking? Is it graded marking? Depending on what you rate. Oh, uh, yes, the, the, the marking scale uh, goes like this. Yes. Uh, oh, no, it's not graded like if you come first or anything like that. There's five, it's not like a, uh, we'll have a competition sort of for fun, but the number of marks you'll get <clears throat> will be just dependent on the size of the N you can get it to. So there's, I think, five marks available for, what does it say? Here we are. There are five marks for performance, three marks for writing a journal of what you do, two marks for having good program style, and up to one bonus mark for very fast programs. So you might have some ridiculous race at the end for one bonus mark. But does someone want to ask a question about the assignment because you don't understand what you've got to do? Yes? Um, with the, the muting and stuff, yes. where does that go? Like, you take that input and then... Ah, yeah, okay. So that's a good question. His question was, how do you guys deal with the permuting? What happens is your program has a table of all the instructions. Let's look at the instructions for this machine. It looks very suspiciously similar to another computer you might have seen quite recently. <laughs> it's in fact almost exactly the same as the um, 4, 2, for 1. There's only one instruction that's changed. As well as printing out with instruction 8 now, it also does a bitwise XOR of the data. So it's essentially exactly the same as a chip you've seen already. And your tutor will tell you what bitwise XOR means in the tutor next week if you don't know. Or look it up. It's, it's a trivial thing. So here is the old machine that you used in the assignment last year. And you want to change that machine. So if someone put in the permutation, you tell me a permutation. Tell me a permutation. Uh, let me... Um, let me edit the spec. Here we go. Someone tell me a permutation that you might get fed in. Say it again. Uh, do the whole thing backwards. You want to do it backwards? All right, we'll do it backwards. Here we go. So the permutation that gets fed in is, I'm just vandalizing the spec here, F, E, D, C, B, A. Oh, that's hard. <coughs> I can do the next bit easily. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. I thought easily. <laughs> so here are the old chip instructions. Here are the new chip instructions. And here is the meaning. Let's just stick the new instructions in. So the old instruction was zero for a halt, but under this permutation, what's the code for halt now? F. The old instruction for add was 1, but under this permutation, what's the new one? The old uh, was 2, but now it's D. 
D. Does it all make sense to everyone? Yeah. I'm going to have to do it all now, aren't I? Because I've just got this compulsive sort of finishing thing going on. No, I haven't. Okay. Let me hang on a sec. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Let me just. Does this make sense? The old instructions, the new instructions, <laughs> not finished off very nicely. And here we go. You see, the halt is now F, add is now E, subtract is now D, increments now C. It's exactly the same as before. It's just only the values have changed. Yes. But even if you just permutate the instructions, couldn't the student have like picked up an original program and sort of translated oh. from? Yes. So the question is, how effective is my permuting the instructions at thwarting you copying? Wait and see. It might make no difference, or it might be a big difference. Also, the student, let me guess, the student doesn't get the original instruction set. No, the student's allowed to know the original instruction set. And, and the original one's irrelevant anyway. Uh, all that's important is the one you get. Oh, we've nearly run out of time, and I promised an early mark. Quick, um, don't look at the clock. Up, up. <laughs> Go, go, get out of here. Go, go, quick, quick, leave, leave. We've still got a minute left. Get out, go, 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 out, 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 quick. Yes. Um,